Could you spot a murderer simply by looking at their face? Take a look at the following people. Which one do you think is the murderer? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to start to explore biological explanations of crime. There are three we'll cover in this series, a genetic explanation, a neural explanation, and in this video, a historical approach known as atavistic form. On a dark, cold morning of December 1870, while analysing Brigand Villela's skull, I had a sudden realisation and solved the problem of the delinquency's nature. These were the words of Cesare Lombroso, an Italian scientist in the 19th century. He was describing the moment where he thought he'd discovered a physical way of identifying and explaining criminal behaviour. He was examining the dead body of Giuseppe Villela, a convicted criminal who had gone to prison for theft and arson. What Lombroso spotted was a median occipital dimple in the man's skull, an indentation that looked similar to ones found in lemurs and rodents. And for Lombroso, this was evidence that criminal behaviour was biological. At the sight of that skull, I seemed to see, all of a sudden, the problem of the nature of the criminal, an atavistic being who reproduces in his person the ferocious instincts of primitive humanity and the inferior animals. In his 1876 book called Criminal Man, Lombroso suggested that criminals were a more primitive version of humans. He formulated his ideas at the time when Charles Darwin had recently introduced the theory of of evolution. And based on this theory, Lombroso suggested that criminals are essentially evolutionary throwbacks to an earlier species who were inferior to non-criminals. This brings us to atavism, or the atavistic form. Atavistic means a tendency to revert to an ancestral type. Atavis is the Latin for ancestor. And for Lombroso, these criminal types could be identified by certain distinctive physical features. Lombroso wrote, There is an asymmetry of the face, excessive dimensions of the jaw and cheekbones, eye defects and peculiarities, ears of unusual size, or standing out from the head, as do those of the chimpanzee, nose twisted or flattened in thieves, or beak-like in murderers, chin receding or excessively long or short and flat as in an ape. Other physical markers included dark skin and the existence of extra toes, nipples or fingers. Now it's important to emphasise here that the cause of criminal behaviour is not because of their face or the funny looking ears or extra toes. For Lombroso, that's how you identify them. Listen again to Lombroso. These anomalies in the face, when numerous and marked, constitute the criminal type. They are not the cause of the antisocial tendencies of the criminal, they are the outward and visible sign of a mysterious and complicated process of degeneration, which in the case of the criminal evokes evil impulses that are largely of atavistic origin. The explanation, the reason why they commit crimes, according to Lombroso, is because they are genetic throwbacks. They are less evolved, and therefore the behaviour of these biological throwbacks will inevitably not fit in with the rules and expectations of modern civilised society. Now you might be thinking at this point, what a ridiculous theory. Well, I'm going to show you shortly how even today with modern technology, the idea that you can identify a criminal by their facial features hasn't gone away, it's still alive and kicking. But just before we get to that, we need to critically think through Lombroso's theory. Did his ideas about atavistic form and facial features just come out of his mind, or did he actually try to investigate this? To his credit, Lombroso developed carefully designed tools to measure body parts with great precision and designed tests to determine sensitivity to pain. He then went on to examine the skull and facial features of large numbers of Italian convicts and proposed that the atavistic form was associated with a number of physical defects which were key indicators of criminality. In all, Lombroso examined the skulls of nearly 4,000 criminals as well as, wait for it, 383 dead criminals. He concluded that 40% of criminal acts are committed by people with atavistic characteristics. So there you have it, definitive proof for the atavistic form. 
Not so fast. There are many problems with Lombroso's research. Firstly, it was correlational. This means that his research investigated a relationship between physical defects in the face and the skull and criminal behaviour. However, there is a lack of control of variables in such research, which means that it cannot be said that this research demonstrates that atavistic form is the cause of criminal behaviour. For example, some have argued that the physical defects could have been the result of poor nutrition in childhood and criminal behaviour such as theft could be explained in terms of environmental factors such as poverty. Secondly, there was no control group in his research. Lombroso found these physical defects in the group of offenders, but he did not have a group to compare them with, a group of normal, non-criminal people. It could be that the physical defects he identified were actually not that abnormal from the average population. In fact, Goring in 1913 carried out a study that compared over 3,000 London criminals with a non-criminal control group and did not find evidence of an atavistic form in the criminal group. In other words, there was no difference between the two groups in relation to Lombroso's theory. Despite these criticisms, Lombroso has been praised by some as the father of modern criminology. This is because he was the first person to make crime and criminals a specific area of study which has led to much improved theories of offending that we have today. In fact, if someone studies criminology at university, usually the first lecture is on Lombroso himself. Some have also suggested that in trying to describe how particular types of people are likely to commit particular crimes, it was the beginning of offender profiling. He was the first to tell the police that criminals had a distinctive set of characteristics that could help narrow down the list of suspects. However, one of the major ways Lombroso's theory has been criticised is for being biologically deterministic. This is because his theory states that the cause of criminal behaviour is because of an uncontrollable, inborn biological factor. A person is a genetic throwback, a less evolved person. This implies that a person has no choice over their behaviour, which flies in the face of the free will argument. It can lead people to blame their biology for their behaviour. In this case, if someone committed a crime, they could argue that it's not their fault. It's not their responsibility because they can't do anything about their biology. But if someone stood up in court and used that as their defence, the judge would still say, you are responsible for your actions and so you will bear the consequences. In other words, a purely deterministic view is at odds with the justice system and society's understanding of responsibility. Finally, Lombroso's atavistic theory has been criticised for its scientific racism. This is because, as we saw earlier, part of Lombroso's description of the criminal form included things like dark skin, and some have argued that some of Lombroso's descriptions of the criminal type had racial prejudice. This led to the negative stereotyping of certain groups of people based on their appearance leading to discrimination. His theory also led others to use it as support for eugenics. This is the theory that a population could be improved by controlling reproduction to increase the number of desirable inherited characters. Characteristics. In other words, some people are born with genetic weaknesses and some with genetic advantages, and to benefit society, those with the genetic weaknesses should be eliminated to improve the genetic quality of the population. And lastly, one of the major problems of his theory is that it can lead to people like this being overlooked. This was Ted Bundy, a serial killer, who lacks the features that Lombroso suggested and was reported as being handsome and charming. When Ted Bundy was arrested, people were shocked because he didn't look like a serial killer. Remember those people from the start of the video? Who did you pick as the murderer? This man was a serial killer and so was this guy. How many of Lombroso's features do they have? So has the world of criminology moved on from the work of Lombroso? Well, yes. As we'll see in the next videos in this series, there are more developed biological understandings of crime, as well as theories around personality and other factors. But Lombroso's ideas haven't completely gone from our modern day. Check out this controversial study carried out in China in 2019. The researchers gathered ID photos from nearly two 2,000 people, many of whom were non-criminal, ordinary citizens, but over 700 of the photos were
number of convicted criminals. They use these photos to train a computer algorithm of what to look for, and according to their findings, the algorithm was able to correctly identify other criminals 89% of the time using only their facial features. Now that's a scary finding. In the next video, we're going to explore whether there is a criminal gene. To watch that, you can click the video on the screen now, and for more resources related to psychology, check out the website linked below. I hope you found this video helpful, and we'll see you in the next one.